On the morning of August 25, 2016, a tense silence filled the Ryan family home. Brett Ryan, feeling desperate and trapped by his own lies, was ready for a day that would change everything. He hid in his mother's garage, holding a crossbow, his weapon of choice. Brett had set up a clever digital trick to make it look like he was spending an ordinary day at home. As he sat there in the stillness, his mind buzzed with the gravity of what he was about to do. Brett Ryan was born in 1981 in Canada into a warm and supportive family. His parents, Susan and Bill and his three brothers, formed a tight-knit household. Christopher and Leland were the eldest siblings, born in 1974 and 1979 respectively. Brett was the third child, followed by the youngest, Alexander, who was born in 1987. Bill was a calm man deeply concerned with mental health, teaching classes at a local community center to stay fit and healthy. He also worked as a budget director for the Toronto Star newspaper. Susan, Brett's mother, was a cheerful yet firm woman, dedicated to household chores and raising her children. She had a passion for gardening and was an avid baseball fan. At 16, Brett graduated from high school and immediately enrolled at the University of Toronto with numerous plans. However, academics were not his only concern, as he was already worrying about money. He decided to work painting houses during the summer to cover his basic needs, buy clothes, and enjoy various recreational activities. People who knew Brett described him as always smiling and very polite. He was also very helpful, volunteering and refereeing minor league games at the local community center. Handsome and generous, he made friends easily. Despite his many attributes and above-average intelligence, university proved too challenging, and he eventually dropped out. Initially, this did not seem to affect him much, but reality soon caught up with him. While his friends built successful careers in fields like finance, healthcare, and education, Brett worked as a house painter. What started as a summer job became a full-time occupation. Behind his broad smile and worn-out paintbrush, desperation was growing. As one of the younger children, Brett lived with his parents and often received help from Bill, Susan, and his older brothers. His main issue was attempting to maintain a lifestyle that did not match his earning potential. At that time, Christopher was working with the Toronto Transit Commission, and Leland, considered the artist of the family, was studying photography and playing the drums and guitar. Alexander, the youngest Ryan, was intelligent and excelled in his studies, even attending a school for gifted children. While his brother's lives seemed to be on track, Brett's life was drowning in growing debt, and he soon felt overwhelmed. By 2007, at the age of 26, his financial situation was dire, with debts exceeding $60,000. The crisis was not just financial. It spread to other areas of his life, leading to personal problems. He needed to increase his income urgently and spent hours thinking about what to do, which took a toll on him. Despite this, he projected a different image. Neighbors and friends saw Brett as a standout athlete, the life of the party, and often remarked that he was an extrovert in a family of introverts. 
Despite his worsening situation and periodic bouts of depression, Brett always tried to project a positive and strong image. He wanted to be admired, not pitied. However, the life Brett was living was far from what he had envisioned for himself. His erratic and criminal past began to unfold as he devised various plans. With above-average intelligence, instead of using it to earn extra income honestly, he embarked on a criminal career. The winning idea he had was to rob a bank. On October 20, 2007, Brett walked into an ICBC bank disguised as a patient, with bandages covering his face, wearing a hoodie, and with his left arm in a sling. He limped and carried an envelope supposedly containing professional documents. When it was his turn, he handed the teller a note stating it was a robbery and that he was armed, demanding $2,000 or more. The teller gave him just over $1,000, but for Brett, it was a triumph. He spent the next eight months robbing banks using the same method. Brett embraced the theatricality of his crimes, deciding to change his bandage disguise after the second robbery. He bought a high-quality beard and earned the nickname The Bearded Bandit in the media. He also wore a hat similar to the one worn by the protagonist of the show Gilligan's Island, paired with glasses, a checkered shirt, and a dark jacket. After planning his next heist, he struck again, obtaining between $2,000 and $3,000 in each robbery. After one of Brett's robberies, the police tracked his vehicle using an external camera and traced him back to his home. Several weeks later, when Brett Ryan approached another bank ready to make a withdrawal, the police had already been monitoring him for 15 days. He entered the bank, quickly turned around, and exited. Waiting outside were officers ready to arrest him. Brett pled guilty and spent the next seven months in police custody awaiting trial. He was charged with 29 counts of armed robbery committed while disguised. In total, he had stolen $28,000. In January 2009, Brett found himself in a small, windowless room in the Ontario Court of Justice. Several close friends had written letters of support to the court, detailing Brett's generosity and volunteer work, hoping to influence the judge's decision favorably. Although many charges were dropped, he was convicted of committing eight robberies. The court sentenced him to 45 months in prison, minus the seven months he had already served. The judge also imposed a lifetime ban on possessing any firearms, even though none were ever found or proven to be in his possession. Brett made his first request for parole as soon as possible, but the parole board denied it. The board believed he needed to address his depressive episodes to qualify for parole. Brett accepted the recommendations and began attending professional sessions to tackle his mental health issues. The board also noted Brett's efforts to reconnect with his estranged family, discussing his depression with them. It was hoped that acknowledging his problem to his family would help manage his episodes. However, one treating psychiatrist warned that Brett could develop a more severe form of depression due to its hereditary nature. At the next parole hearing, his mother, father, and one of his brothers attended. This was seen favorably by the board, along with the fact that Brett's treatment involved counseling rather than medication. The documents showed he received seven counseling sessions with a psychologist during this time. The psychologist's report indicated that Brett did not need ongoing psychological therapy or supportive counseling, but had the option to return if necessary. The Canadian Parole Board members noted that Brett had complied with all conditions and maintained a low risk of reoffending, granting him full parole on November 24, 2010. Brett returned home to his family, ready to start anew. However, freedom brought challenges Brett was unprepared for. Outside prison, he found a harsher world than he had left. Unable to escape his debt, he declared bankruptcy. 
His criminal past was easily discovered by potential employers who Googled his name and found his history of disguises and bank robberies. Brett tried to resume his house painting business, but most potential clients refused to hire him due to his past. Approaching 30 years old, Brett struggled to escape his reality as an ex-convict with no higher education and few prospects. His mother, Susan, was upset by neighbors' comments about their family. She and Bill sold their house and bought a small bungalow in Scarborough. The family decided to move to start a new life away from their former neighbors' remarks, eager to leave behind the years of Brett's imprisonment. The Ryans made the most of their new home. Susan transformed the front yard into an elaborate garden, filled with flowering plants, small shrubs, and a cat statue. Brett began taking steps to achieve the success he had always envisioned. He worked in low-paying retail jobs, but with some financial help from his parents, re-enrolled at the University of Toronto to pursue a degree in biophysics. He also made a concerted effort to be more open with his family. He visited a psychologist who emphasized that the lesson from his criminal past was to be honest with those closest to him. As the Ryans settled into their new community, they effectively started fresh. Each family member gradually resumed their activities. It seemed the storm had passed. Things were steadily improving each day. In September 2011, a friend set Brett Ryan up on a blind date with Kristen Baxter, a blonde and athletic physiotherapist. They met near her beachfront condominium. Kristen lived the happy life Brett desired for himself. She had a good job, a lovely home, and enjoyed hiking, traveling, and walking her dog. She was a pleasant young woman who looked like a magazine model, with a reserved smile that contrasted with her loud laughter when amused. Despite knowing Brett's criminal past, Kristen fell in love with him. By January 2013, they moved in together at her condo. Living with Kristen marked a significant change from his family's suburban bungalow. The condo was small but offered a stunning view of the lake beyond Toronto's islands. Brett could barbecue on the roof, watch planes land at the airport, and swim in the pool on the second floor which had both covered and open areas. They frequently traveled to tropical places and enjoyed a dreamlike life together. However, fate had another twist in store for Brett. In 2014, his father Bill passed away, dealing a heavy blow. Brett's depression resurfaced along with financial problems. Brett confided in his therapist, trying to follow their advice. Following Bill's death, Brett paid more attention to his mother, helping her with administrative tasks Bill had once handled and doing odd jobs around the house for extra money. He needed the money, especially after proposing to Kristen with a diamond ring. Once again, his finances were crumbling, and as his bank account dwindled, he began spinning a web of lies. As months and years passed, Brett continued working, studying, and maintaining his family and romantic relationships as best as he could. But in reality, he was struggling with his past problems and hiding everything from everyone. In 2015, he dropped out of university again, but kept it a closely guarded secret. Kristen and her family believed he was still studying. He didn't even tell his therapist. By spring 2016, he received a job offer from a tech company in Toronto. This thrilled him, and he was convinced things would get better. He immediately told Kristen and his family, but within days, his past came back to haunt him. The company withdrew the offer after discovering his criminal record. Despite this, Brett convinced Kristen, his mother, and his brothers that he was still studying and had started the new job. As part of the deception, he dressed up and left home every day, leading everyone to believe he was managing his work and studies perfectly. He kept up appearances by smiling and doing everything possible to maintain his facade of happiness. On social media, he posted about various events, radiating joy, surrounded by friends, family, and his devoted girlfriend, Kristen. 
He portrayed himself as an extroverted, popular, and friendly person, but internally he was under immense pressure, a ticking time bomb. In his desperate attempt to keep up appearances and show that everything was going well, Brett and Kristen agreed to get married on September 16, 2016. The date held special significance as it marked their first date in 2011. The wedding was to be held at a luxurious venue in Ontario, costing $100 per person. At this point, it seemed Brett had finally taken control of his life. His mother, Susan, was so proud that she often bragged about his achievements to neighbors. She spoke of his university degree, good job, beautiful downtown apartment, and upcoming wedding. Paradoxically, Brett depended more on his mother than ever. With so many financial demands on the horizon, he pressured her to take on more paying jobs at home. But even with Susan's help, Brett's situation was becoming dire. Less than a month before the wedding, after over a year of piling lie upon lie, Brett finally followed his psychologist's advice and confessed everything to his mother. Susan's world shattered as she listened to her son admit that he needed to secure a good job but required her full support as a mother until then. To Brett's surprise, instead of rescuing him, she issued an ultimatum. Susan told him he had to tell Kristen the truth and announced that she wouldn't give him any more money until he did. Cornered with no way out, Brett devised a sinister plan. Outwardly, he continued to appear as the most extroverted and friendly person in the group, but each day he felt worse. He tried to manage the fragile web of lies, knowing it was only a matter of time before everything collapsed. Brett sought the right moment to talk and relieve himself of the burden, but days passed and he didn't take the necessary step to come clean. Meanwhile, Susan constantly reminded him of the importance of honesty, especially with Kristen. She pressured him, saying that if he didn't speak up, she would. She revealed that she had discussed the situation with his three brothers, and they agreed with her. Unknowingly, Susan pushed Brett to the breaking point. She thought Brett would make the right decision, but never imagined how wrong she was. While she saw a look of remorse on her son's face, Brett was contemplating the most terrible plans to cover his lies. Determined to keep Kristen in the dark, he would go to any lengths, fearing she wouldn't forgive him and would end the relationship. Brett felt he couldn't bear another failure and began plotting how to silence his family. Brett Ryan thought that if he could scare his family with threats, he might prevent them from talking. But as he perceived their determination to tell Kristen the truth, he concluded that silencing them permanently was the only solution. In his mind, he began devising a macabre plan involving a crossbow, a silent weapon. Acquiring one was relatively easy and wouldn't pose any significant problem, as it didn't require a permit. The court restriction against him wouldn't be an obstacle either. He just needed to be over 18 years old. In Canada, crossbows are commonly used for hunting activities, so Brett bought a second-hand one, leaving no transaction record. During one of his visits to his mother's house, he hid the crossbow among some debris in the garage, where a kitchen renovation was underway. On the morning of August 25, 2016, Brett was determined to end his anguish. He set up an elaborate mechanism to create the perfect digital alibi. He gathered his laptop, two four-pound weights, a wooden spoon, a digital timer, and an oscillating fan. He propped his laptop against the wall with the weights, taped the spoon to the fan, and positioned it so that the tip aligned with the enter key on the keyboard. He connected the fan to the timer, programming it to turn on in the morning. Each time the fan moved, the spoon would press the enter key, making it appear as if Brett was watching YouTube videos. He prepared a similar setup with his tablet, phone, styluses, two oscillating fans, and two timers. 
He taped a stylus to each fan and secured the tablet and phone to wooden boards with screws. When the fans turned on, the styluses would send pre-written messages, making it seem like Brett was home all day, watching videos and sending emails. The next step was to leave his house without being caught on any security cameras. He exited the condo by taking the stairs to a back alley, avoiding the cameras, and headed to the public transit terminal. He took a train, got off at Eglinton Station, and walked to his mother's house. He arrived at 10 a.m. wearing two pairs of jeans, one over the other. He carried a bag with extra clothes, a wig, a fisherman's hat, and several crossbow bolts. Susan was surprised to see him. She wanted to rest as she was battling a cold but engaged in conversation with her son despite her fatigue. Brett tried to persuade his mother to keep quiet, but she was determined to talk to Kristen. In minutes, they were arguing heatedly. Brett rushed to the garage with Susan following, insisting he tell the truth. She called Christopher, Brett's older brother, and warned Brett that he was on his way. That was the final straw. Brett attacked his mother, shooting her in the cheek and ear with a crossbow bolt. He then strangled her with a yellow nylon cord. Susan was 66 years old. After killing his mother, Brett hid her body under some debris, covering it with a tarp. He then loaded the crossbow and waited for his brother Christopher. When Christopher arrived, Brett silently approached from behind and shot him in the neck, killing him instantly. He dragged his brother's body to the garage, placed it on top of their mother's, and covered them with the tarp. Christopher was 42 years old. Shortly after, his younger brother Alexander, 29, arrived. Brett struck him in the neck with a bolt, leaving him severely injured. Leland, 37, was napping in his room but rushed downstairs upon hearing a scream. Adrenaline and rage fueled Brett as he was determined to see his plan through. Leland thought Alexander had had an accident and didn't understand why Brett told him not to call for help. In seconds, a brutal fight ensued between the brothers. Brett, intent on killing Leland and Leland fighting for his life. Meanwhile, Alexander managed to drag himself to the front door. The intense fight took them through various parts of what was once a warm family home. They fought in the living room, dining room, and two bedrooms until Leland finally escaped, screaming for help, and ran to the neighbor's house. As soon as they opened the door, Leland stumbled in, asking him to call emergency services and ensure the police arrived quickly before passing out. Meanwhile, Brett took a bottle of water from the fridge, not bothering to close the door. He sent an email to Kristen, saying he had ruined everything and everyone, apologizing for not controlling his mental and antisocial issues. He then walked like a sleepwalker and calmly sat at the entrance of the house, covered in blood from head to toe, realizing he had destroyed his world. Within minutes, police and homicide investigators arrived. Brett was sitting near Alexander, who was still breathing. Brett told the officers he should have taken Alexander to the hospital and added that there were two more bodies in the garage. He confessed to the murders, stating he used a crossbow. At that moment, the scene was swarming with police. Shortly after Brett's arrest, Toronto police entered Kristen's apartment and discovered the devices he had set up for his alibi. Initially unsure of what to make of them, they evacuated the building and called in the specialized threat response team. The specialists disconnected the fans and removed the pencils before the timers activated. They determined it was a ruse to make it appear that someone, in this case, Brett, was using the devices from that location. The police stated that preliminary investigations revealed three deceased individuals, one female and two males, and an injured man who had been taken to the hospital. He also confirmed that they had the perpetrator in custody. The crossbow allegedly used in the attacks was recovered at the scene. 
he added that they would continue investigating to determine the motive and gather all evidence left at the crime scene to get a clear and objective view of what transpired. The community was shaken, saddened by the events, but also terrified. Most neighbors had lived in the area for 10, 20, or more years. In the days following the incident, everyone began locking their doors, and they came and went with caution and fear. While the neighbors grappled with a newfound sense of insecurity, Brett had to give statements to the police. He admitted to killing his mother and two of his brothers, but claimed his initial intent was only to scare them. He said that when he went to the garage for the crossbow, it was to intimidate his mother, but he lost control. When brought before the court, he waived his right to a preliminary hearing and pleaded guilty. He hired a renowned criminal defense attorney known for representing high-profile clients, particularly in criminal cases. Brett faced charges of three counts of first-degree murder with various aggravating factors. However, he argued that the charge for his mother's death should be second-degree murder, as he didn't intend to kill her. Regarding his brother Christopher, Brett admitted to first-degree murder since he waited in hiding and ambushed him with the crossbow. For his brother Alexander, who arrived unexpectedly, he accepted a second-degree murder charge. In the case of Leland, he admitted to attempted murder and acknowledged inflicting multiple injuries. The trial was relatively brief. In the next hearing, Brett appeared before the jury and, through sobs, expressed deep regret for his actions, apologizing to his friends, Kristen, and especially his surviving brother, Leland. He vowed to use the time and opportunities presented to him, repeatedly saying how sorry he was. Brett insisted he hadn't intended to use the alibi devices, claiming he decided to talk to his mother instead. However, the expert report contradicted him, stating that the devices would have functioned to make it appear someone was at home watching YouTube and sending emails if they hadn't been disabled. The judge acknowledged Brett's immediate guilty plea and noted his apparent remorse and willingness to be accountable for his actions. The judge also remarked that Brett was, in a way, a victim trapped in a web of lies. Ultimately, Brett was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences for each murder, plus an additional 10 years for the assault on Leland. He would be eligible for parole in 2041 at the age of 60. Leland Ryan chose not to speak to the media, but shared his anguish in court. He described the horror of fighting for his life against his own brother and then seeing his mother and brothers dead. He admitted struggling to sleep and living in constant sorrow and distress. Brett had believed in the fantasies he created in his mind, but when everything fell apart, instead of facing reality, he lost himself in a labyrinth of lies with the worst possible outcome. At 35 years old, Brett had been weeks away from marrying the woman of his dreams, living in a beachfront condo. Perhaps, if he had told the truth, Kristen might have understood. But now, that possibility is lost forever, as Brett destroyed every bridge with his terrible actions. Thanks for tuning in to Unreal True Crime. If you're intrigued by mysteries from around the world, check out our new channel, Latin Crimes, where we dive into the gripping true crime stories of Latin America. Don't miss out. Subscribe now for more thrilling investigations.